Welcome to Chapter 5 on Consumer Credit. Now, I apologize in advance, dear students, because in this chapter, I sometimes get off on my uh, high horse and sound like a Southern Baptist preacher, hellfire and damnation, snakes, <laughs> handling snakes and speaking in tongues. And so I apologize. But as we're going to see as we go through this chapter, there are tremendous pitfalls to consumer credit. And at the same time, it's something that most all of us are going to want to utilize because we live in this society. And we'll deal with that issue also. But first, let's start with a quote. It's a little raw. I apologize in advance. But when I read it, I knew I had to use it. Borrowing money is like wetting your bed in the middle of the night. At first, all you feel is warmth and release. But very, very quickly comes the awful, cold discomfort of reality. Thank you, Elizabeth Gilbert. Yes, I know it is it is very uh <laughs> graphic, but it really is the truth. And for many people, they get themselves into serious trouble very quickly after a moment's or a few moments worth of uh pleasure. Slide number two. What is consumer credit? So, so here's a definition that's going to be on the exam. Credit is an arrangement to receive cash, goods, or services now and pay for them in the future. Consumer credit is the use of credit for personal needs. Well, what does that mean? That excludes home loans, home improvement loans, and loans for higher education. And the book has this wonderful understatement. It is a major force in the American economy. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> the benevolent machine wants you to use consumer credit. Why? Because they're making tons of money off of you. Good parasites know they need to find new hosts so they can stick the needle in your arm and start sucking out your blood. There are three ways consumers can finance current purchases. They can take money from savings, use present earnings, or borrow against future income. And that is why when you submitted your goals and your actions, and I would always say, where is the money going to come from? Tell, be specific. Are you, going to, are you going to use it from income? Are you going to take money from savings? Are you going to forego something else? Right, tell us, be specific, because there's only so many ways you can get money. And the book, again, has this wonderful penchant for understatement. Trade-offs are evolved in using credit. Opportunity costs. Yes. What does that mean? We make the wrong decisions, we make our life miserable. Slide number three, which is it? And in the face-to-face -face class, this is where we would pull out our ABC cards. Does consumer credit increase or decrease your purchasing power? Hmm. A, consumer credit increases your purchasing power. B, consumer credit decreases your purchasing power. Or C, consumer credit has no effect on your purchasing power. And this is where you would, we would ask people to um, raise their hands and their, and their um, choices. And many people will pick A. And you ask them why. And they say, well, because you get to buy the stuff now. You get to have the items that you want, the services, the goods now. And some people will say, well, wait a minute. No, they wind up costing more. So the answer really is B, consumer credit decreases your purchasing power. And please don't get this wrong on the exam. It's bad for my self-esteem. Why? Why does it decrease your purchasing power? Slide number four. Because it ain't free. It's that simple. The cost of credit is the finance charge. That is the total dollar amount you pay for the loan. Now, according to the Truth in Lending Act, it must include all interest, all fees, any service charges, or credit-related insurance, which is required as part of the loan. 
If it's not required, then they don't have to include it in the APR, and that's what they often do. They'll try to sign you up afterwards. The annual percentage rate, the APR, is the percentage cost of credit on a yearly basis. Remember APY in Chapter 4, the, what we receive, annual percentage yield? Now we're talking about the annual percentage rate. The APR provides the true rate of interest for comparison with other sources of credit. This allows you to compare like with like when you're shopping for rates. It used to be, oh, this is many years ago, 1970s, before that, 1960s, that some companies would advertise 14% and others would advertise 18%, but the 14% was actually more than the 18%. Well, no more. That is not allowed anymore according to the Truth in Lending Act which we take a look at on slide number five. It requires creditors to provide you with accurate and complete credit cost terms and annual percentage rate. Creditors must disclose credit terms and information in a clear and conspicuous manner in a form you can keep, but often in a font you cannot possibly read, and that is where they put all the information they do not want you to read, such as what happens if you miss a single payment, your interest rate goes up to a thousand percent, and they come and they take your house and your firstborn, and you'll be in debt to them for the rest of your life, which won't be that long, since you'll be working yourself to death trying to pay the interest, but they don't care because they will have already made enough money to offer you to buy one or, or maybe even two yachts and a brand new gas barbecue and a trip around the world. You, you get the picture, folks. Do you read the fine print? No, you don't. No. Is the judge, when you are called in front, for, for which you were called in front of, going to ask you if you read the fine print? No. The judge is going to ask you, did you sign the contract? They don't care whether you read it or not. Did you sign it? That's why it's fine print. They don't want you to read it. Will you read it from now on? Nod your heads. Yes, yes, you will. And if you can't understand it, call them up and ask them what the hell it means. Because if you're 18 or over, you are legally bound. Now we'll discuss bankruptcy, how a lot of people get out of the, their, uh, their uh, uh, requirements, out of their obligations that they've, they've uh, signed up for. But still, the idea is you are, in a court of law, going to be held responsible for your, for your actions. So read the fine print. Slide number six. How do we calculate the cost of credit? Well, we've already taken a quick look at the formula, which is used at the heart of how calculations are made, and that is simple interest. Interest is equal to principal times rate times time. Now, remember, the time always has to be expressed in years. And some of the problems we would do in the in the face-to-face, -face. we would do a couple of the problems right now as practice, and you're going to do them on your own, and, and they're pretty straightforward, folks, but just be careful, because time has to be in years. And this is used in its simplest form for installment loans, and what are those? Often called closed-end loans, automobile loans, uh, home loans, uh, furniture loans, and the like. But credit cards use various other methods where they at the heart of it is this this simple interest principal times rate times time but they use weighted averages of the account balance throughout the current billing period which means in layman's term their computers are so darn sophisticated they know how much you owe them every day and they average that that's called the average daily balance method and if you carry over a balance, don't pay the, don't pay the, the uh, credit card in full, your new purchases will be included in your average daily balance calculation. What does that mean? That means they're starting to suck your blood out. You don't get to take advantage of the float. The pay it in full and not pay a single dime of interest. We'll discuss the float in, in detail later on. There are other methods, the adjusted balance method, which is the most favorable to credit card holders, but surprise is the least common method often used by credit unions. There's the previous balance method, which is in between the two of the average balance and the adjusted balance. And then there's the two cycle average daily balance method, which is the worst method. And that is luckily not very common. Um, American excuse, I'm sorry, excess, American Express, American Express 
was uh, notorious for using this, but I don't think they use it anymore. Uh, here's an article for those of you who, who are uh, uh, interested in, in the, uh, the, the uh, details, because it is very detailed, folks. And they give you examples. Uh, just know that, yes, they're sucking your blood out, folks. Whichever method they're using, it is a very expensive way to, to borrow money. Slide number eight. Do you remember our $299 stereo? <laughs> yeah. Remember that depending on our tax bracket, it costs us almost two times more than $299 because of the sales tax and the income taxes and Social Security, Medicare. Well, what if we had done the American boogie and put that on the credit card with 19.9% APR and 2.2% minimum and just made the minimum payments? the price just doubled again. Exactly. Yeah. Do you think about what it costs you for that five minutes of extreme pleasure when you walk out of Worst Buy with that new iPod 27.5 S? Will you now? I certainly hope so. Since all of those dollars are after tax dollars, the true cost of the $299 stereo, it depends on your tax bracket. And, and those of you just getting started out in the 10 or 15% bracket, it's not 1200 bucks. But once you get into the 25, 31, 30, yeah, right, yeah it, you're doubling the price yeah, every, if you use credit. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Slide number nine. So when should you use personal credit? Well, these are the three, and I hate this term, good debts. You'll hear financial advisors, you'll read about uh, uh, in financial publications and, and, and books about good debt. I don't, it's like oxymoron, it's like, uh, you know, jumbo shrimp, it just doesn't exist. Uh, but anyway, it's debt, and it's important, and it's important part because how many people buy their home cash? And we'll discuss mortgages in Chapter 7. So for a home purchase, for home improvement, for higher education, career-related education, these are good debts. Why are they good debts? Because homes increase in value during normal times. Real estate goes down sometimes, and boy, did it go down in the turmoil of 2009, 2008, 9, 10. But, but no, a home is an investment. It's a place to live, too. Home Improvements, obviously, don't think it's going to raise the price of your house. Some do, most don't. But why is higher education? Why is that our career-related education? Right, because you're increasing your earning power. Right, so that these are good debts. <laughs> don't go overboard, especially with higher education and home improvement. So when should you use consumer credit? Which, if you remember our definition, excludes those three. Excludes home purchase, higher education, home improvement. When should you use it? Never. All right, all right, okay. In case of an emergency, your car had a baby, your sister needs a new transmission, okay, yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, when, try our easy payment plan, dear students. No money down. 100%, I'm sorry, 100% down, no monthly payments. My apologies, I lost it somewhere. E exactly. Uh, remember our goals? Set yourself a goal. You don't have to have that thing right now. In three months, maybe something better will come along or you don't want it anymore. You don't need it anymore. So instead of swiping that card and having the credit card companies suck the blood out of you, Save up for it. And and some of you, you probably never heard of this, but some of you might have heard of layaway. Before consumer credit, 1960s, 1970s, uh, easy availability of credit cards and consumer credit, many people just didn't, sim sim they never took out loans for, for a washing machine or whatever. They would go down to Montgomery Wards or Sears or J.C. Penney's, and they'd say, you know what, I see this is on sale for $300. I have $50 today, which was a lot of money back then, folks. Um, 
it was some people's half of their rent, and 100 bucks a month for a one-bedroom apartment was typical in 1960s, 19, uh, early 70s. And, and they would uh, say, I'll give you the $300 over the next three months. You know, every paycheck, I'll give you 50 bucks. And the Montgomery Wards and Sears, they would say, fine. You know, that's called layaway. And then they got away from it because they realized they could make more money by giving you the credit, giving you the washing machine right now, and charging you interest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Slide number 12. Credit considerations. Before you use credit for a major purchase, ask yourself some questions. Could I pay cash? Could I make a down payment? Lay away. Do I want to use savings for this purchase? Does this purchase, purchase fit with my goals and budget? Could I use the credit I will need in some better way, such as a home improvement or a home or higher education? Can I postpone this purchase? What are the opportunity costs of postponing this purchase? Which means if I don't make this purchase, what are the problems involved there. I mean, I need a washing machine or else I have to pick myself up and get over to the laundromat, which is not the end of the world for a few weeks. And most importantly, what are the dollar and psychological cost of using credit for this purchase? Hmm. Well, we're going to see some later on. Slide number 12. There are some advantages. Yes, I know. I apologize. You get to use the goods and services now. They cost you a whole lot more. They permit the purchase even when the funds are low. They cost you a whole lot more. They're so convenient. We'll deal with the cost of convenience in a bit. They are safer than cash. I will admit that. I do appreciate my credit card when I'm walking around not having to carry cash. But then again, people used to take checks or some of them still do. You can take advantage of the float, and we'll discuss that when we talk about convenience. Some people use their credit cards to get all kinds of rebates, airline miles, bonuses and the like. Fine, but be careful. Use it as a debit card. We'll discuss that later on. Now, here's the most important one, folks, um, in my humble opinion. Demonstrates financial stability. Yes, eventually you want to plug into the benevolent machine and have a credit card, and we'll discuss what, how to do that and how to deal with it, because it's a two-way street, folks. The benevolent machine is going to give you wonderful things, but they want you to be a loyal droogie, and uh, they want to know all about you, and they want to know that you make your payments on time, and that's how you do it. We'll, we'll discuss this in detail. And then the book says, use for financial emergencies, and I agree. I agree. Right, it's a it's a it's it's a safety net, but it's a very expensive safety net, folks. It is much better to make love, not loans, <laughs> and uh, have a cushion and you know, be frugal and just uh, and you, you spend spend less than you earn. You understand, you know that you know this part. We've already drummed it into your heads the best we can. Slide number 14. Because there are disadvantages. Notice there's a whole lot more red and a whole lot more italics. Purchases are more expensive. Does it increase or decrease your purchasing power? That's a test question, folks. The answer is decrease. Temptation to overspend. Yeah, it's so much easier. Hang on a minute. We'll get to the cost, the cost of convenience. It ties up future income because now you have to pay those things back. Possible financial difficulties. you got to love that one. Yeah, not possible, probable. And this one I don't really agree with as much because it's it's not likely with credit cards. They they're not going to come after the the lunch you had on the credit card or the the uh electronic device you bought with your credit card. They're not interested in it. They want their money. This is a problem if you, you they take away your car or your house, but but this is this last one I don't, I don't agree with that so much in the, these are again these are from the book but I, I, you know I agree with the fourth for, the first four look at I've made them red in italics slide 15 the types of credits we've already made reference to closed end credit used for a specific purpose a specific amount mortgages car loans installment loans, that's what they're called, uh, um, uh, furniture, but what else are you going to, eh, not too much else, maybe a computer, unless you're in business, and then this is, you know, all, all kinds of capital equipment that is paid for with closed-end credit. But the other type of credit that is so much more popular is the open-end 
credit, also known as a line of credit. And we'll use this term again when we get to home equity line of credits. You use as you need them until the limit is reached and then they raise your limit, especially if you pay them every month and pay interest. You pay interest and finance charges if you do not pay the bill in full when due. And they go by various names and you should really... Yeah, study the names because I'm going to ask you on the exam. Plus, it's just important to understand these. Revolving credit, prearranged loan, meaning it's been done in advance, you don't have to use it. Uh, credit cards, home equity lines of credit, home equity loans. These are all loans that are used as needed. And if you don't pay a bill, they pay the, the bill in full every month, then you're going to get hit with credit, I mean, uh, finance charges, my apologies. Slide number 16. So let's take turn our attention to credit cards. And I've already skewered these things, haven't I, folks? I apologize, the backwoods Baptist preacher. But I wish I had made this, thing, this up. Uh, Jonathan Clements, a very good writer. If you're interested in personal finance, investing, his books, his magazine articles, uh, he's in the in the news, the, the, the periodicals, the, the uh, newspapers every once in a while. So check him out. I think he might be retired, though. But he called credit cards the bubonic plague of personal finance. I love that term. Remember, you, you're familiar with the bubonic plague? It was very popular during the Middle Ages. It would, you know, wipe out one-third of the population. <laughs> <laughs> as the rats overran the streets because the people killed all the cats because cats were supposed to be worshipped by the devil and familiars and the, the cat the uh, I don't know why they thought that I don't know because they're black I don't understand but with the if you don't have cats then the rats run riot and the fleas on the rats brought the bubonic plague to everybody. You see what religion can... Anyway, anyway, um, I apologize. Uh, nearly 8 out of 10 American households carry one or more credit cards. And yes, you eventually want to want to get one, folks, because the benevolent machine will bestow its graces upon you when you've shown you're a good little robot who can make your payments in full, in my humble opinion, uh, in my advice, every month. And here they are, folks. Here are the, the droogies that you want to be. You want to be a convenience user. You pay off your balance every month. And some people do this. They run it everything. Their, their uh, groceries, their all their utility bills, they run through their credit card so they can get the points and the miles and all the other goody things, the rewards or whatever. It's up to you if you want to do that. But it's important to pay off the balance every month. Why? Because then you don't Pay any interest. And you get the benefits of a, of a benevolent machine without being bled to death. And this is where the language is being turned upside down by, by advertisers and by companies. They refer to convenience users as deadbeats. Now, you millennials, you younger folks, may not have heard this term except maybe deadbeat dad. But it used to be a very popular term. It meant somebody who doesn't pay their debts. A welcher was another uh, uh, 1950s term. And I'm old, so I'm not that old, but I'm, I remember I remember the uh, the 60s. Um, so a deadbeat was somebody who didn't pay their debts. But here they're using it as somebody who does pay their debts because they don't want you to pay your debts in full. They, they want you to pay them, but they want you to pay the minimum balance because that's the way they make the most money. And so, wow. And so that's why I really, really get upset when I find that most high school students are not reading 1984 anymore, which was a, a very, very timely book. I mean, you know, you think, 1984, I was thinking so many years ago. But no, it, the, the year was immaterial. It, it was the, the way that they manipulated, the government manipulated the language. And, uh, you know, we're already past the Orwellian notion of, of Big Brother. Now we've got dozens and dozens of Big Brothers who are cradling us in their arms and changing our brain uh, patterns for their benefit. So you should go out and read 1984. Okay, again, I off my soapbox. The other two-thirds are borrowers. These are the people the benevolent machine love. They use their credit card and they pay the, the minimum. 
Oh, boy. And, you know, it's so lucrative that everybody else wants to get into the act. So now you've got GM and Shell and everybody else linking their credit cards to their businesses. And I think GM was one of the first to do this. If you spent $20,000 of, uh, of goods and services, you got a 1000 bucks off a new car. I don't, I don't know if they still do this, but that was, you know, it's pretty smart. And then they, you know, they become the bank and they start cashing in the uh, the checks of, that you send them for their finance charges. So be careful with credit cards, folks. Slide number 17, uh, they're not the same as debit cards. The laws and the regulations differ. With regard to credit card fraud, as long as you contact them, and it's a legitimate fraud, which we'll discuss, in our, we'll discuss that, uh, you're limited to 50 bucks. But the credit card companies almost always waive that. W-A-I-V-E. They forego that. They, they forgive that. But your debit card, the ATM linked card, has a $50 limit if reported within two days. After that, it's a $500 limit within six months. And if you don't report it within six months, they don't have to pay you a dime back if, if there was some kind of fraud. Now, as we said, most any reputable bank, any reputable credit union will waive the above amounts. They will forego the above amounts. But now do you understand why it is so important for you to reconcile your bank statement, your bank balance, checking account balance with the bank? Yes, because in the case of debit cards, they could just say, tough darts, you know, <laughs> we're not going to pay you all the money back that was fraudulently taken from your account. They won't do it. Don't worry. They won't do it. But, uh, yeah, it could happen. Slide number 18. Here we go. Finally, here we go. This is from the Wealthy Barber again. Uh, Mr. Roy, the Wealthy Barber, gives his pearls of wisdom. What is the cost of convenience? We're going to revisit this in Chapter 6. It's expensive, folks. Here is Kathy, the spendthrift, trying to uh, um, defend her usage of uh, credit cards. But aren't credit cards a good way to save money? As long as you pay the total amount each month, you are essentially getting a free loan. Plus, they are so convenient, said Kathy. Not so fast, said Roy. By taking advantage of the float, as it is called, you may save a few dollars a year. But the pennies you save each year are swamped by the hundreds or even thousands of dollars you spend because of the very same convenience you speak so highly of. How many times have you rationalized the purchase of items simply because you told yourself you wouldn't have to pay for it until next month? And then when the bill came the next month, you ask yourself, how did I spend $500? The cost of that convenience is very high. And what I ask people to do, especially if you use your credit card for many purchases, I say, look, 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 stop using it just for one month. Carry around cash. Now, maybe you don't want to do that, maybe, and you don't have a checking account, you want to use your debit card, whatever. But I want you to, to analyze your emotions, which is something that's not always easy to do because, by definition, they're in movement, emotions, right? And, and you, you have to watch yourself and, and, and notice your feelings as you lay down that cash as opposed to swiping that credit card. Are you with me? Just envision in your head when you go to do it. Now, some of you say, well, I always use my debit card. Fine, that's great, fabulous, fantastic. You're already there because the debit card, you know, the money has to be in the account. But if you're a user of, uh, a big user of credit cards, please try this just for three weeks, a month. Try it. Slide number 19. So in the, in the you know, face-to-face, this is where we have the interaction. All right, how many credit cards do you have? Zero, zilch, not a no way. Forget it. They ain't getting their hooks in me. Be only one, I swear it. I only use it to buy gas. This is me. I'm a big, I, like to, I don't like to carry around cash, so I use my credit card to buy cash. Gas. Okay, number C, I have two. I use one to pay the other off. D, more than two, and I lost count a long time ago. Plus, I ain't going to tell you even if I did know how many I had. And slide number 20. How much do you owe? Well, nothing. Serious, zilch, nada. I don't own a cent. I don't owe a cent. B, less than a thousand. C, between a thousand and five thousand, and more than five thousand. 
If it's D, folks, you're not alone. They're, the average balance is over eight. Well, I think it's gone down below eight grand. But right before the Great Recession of 2008-9, it it was upwards of nine thousand dollars was the average balance, of, which means some people had a whole lot more because a lot of people had zero. Okay, you understand that? But still, that's a lot of money to owe for credit cards. Hang on a minute. Hang on a while because we'll get to the credit card house of horrors. Slide 21. Here's my advice for what it's worth to your students. You just take it or leave it. It's, it is up to you. Use your credit card like a debit card. If you cannot pay off the balance at the end of the month, don't use it. It's that simple. It just don't do it because unless I know it's an emergency, my car had a baby, my sister needed a new transfer. If you find that you abuse your credit card, cut the damn thing up. And notice that I use the singular instead of the plural. Don't have more than one credit card. You know, there's really no good re Well, actually, you might have a side business or you might use one for travel that doesn't have a a transaction fee when you go abroad, like, uh, who's the one? Capital One is very famous for that. My wife and I have a Capital One card that we use when we go abroad because they don't hit you with a 1% to 2 to 3% foreign transaction fee, which is pure profit for them. They don't really have to do it, but they do it because they can, and, and most do, and only a few don't. So there you go. Uh, shop around. But... This is my humble opinion, folks. You decide. You know, it's all very personal. But you're going to want to have one, so here's my advice on how to use it. Use it like a debit card. Be a deadbeat. <laughs> because your credit score will rise. Oh, yes, it will. And the benevolent machine will love you. And and uh, and uh, and you will have get all the, the uh, wonderful benefits of belonging to a civilized... Yes. Yeah, don't I sound like an advertisement? Slide 22, home equity loans. Now, these are loans that are based on the current market value of your home less the amount still owed on the mortgage. Does this sound familiar? Assets, right, the, the, the fair market value of your home minus liability, what you still owe on the, on the home, the mortgage, equals equity, and, and that's why it's called a home equity loan. We call it net worth. It means the same thing. It's also called a second mortgage, a second trust deed, a HELOC or HALOC or however you say it. It's home equity loan of credit. It's going to be much, much cheaper than a credit card. And up until 2018, the interest was normally tax deductible by the vast majority of homeowners, but... No more. Now, there's some, if you go online, some websites, some uh, news outlets say, yeah, yes, this is it. There's no longer any ability to deduct your interest off your home equity line of credit. Others say, no, 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 there is there is still some situation. So, I don't know who to believe. We'll, it, probably by the end of the year, it will have worked itself out uh, of the, the, the end of the 2018 year. But who knows, right? Who knows? Um, now, these home equity line of credits are very cool, folks. Very cool in that it's going to be a whole lot cheaper than most other loans. Why? Because it's based on the value of your house, right? But there is danger here. Peligro. I love the Spanish word for danger. Peligro. Doesn't it sound dangerous? Peligro. If you don't pay your credit cards... You're going to destroy your credit rating, which is not good, folks, but it's not a big deal. I mean, you can build it back up within a year or two simply by getting a secured credit card and uh, paying the the, um, the payments on time, paying off the the um, the loan, the credit card every month, using it, you know, using it for little things to buy. But if you don't pay your home equity line of credit, yeah, you could lose your home, foreclosure. That's a big deal, right? Don't you think? I think so too. Yes. So be careful with these things. Use them for emergencies. The furnace blows up or car had a baby, sister needs a new transmission. Don't use them to go to Tahiti, okay? 
Slide 23. How do these things work? So let's see, see how these things work. And there's a worksheet that in the face-to-face -face class we would go through. So you could go through it now, the interest um, worksheet. Uh, of course, there's a, um, a commentary, so you don't have to uh, do it right now. You can do it later on. But let's say a person has a home of 200000 worth. That's the fair market value. A reasonable buyer would spend that much money to buy this home. But you still owe 150000 on the mortgage. That's the debt. That's the liability. Well, the equity is uh, 200 minus 150 or 50000 You get that? Make sure you understand that. A reputable lender would let you borrow up to 75 or 80% or maybe even 90% of the current value of your home. So let's use 80%, which is not atypical. 80% of the fair market value of 200000 is $160,000. So let's see. That's how much they're going to lend us. But uh, wait a minute. We still owe 150. dollars That's not going to go away. So you take the hundred and fifty. I'm sorry, the hundred and sixty dollars that they're going to lend us, but you take away, you, you have to subtract the, the existing mortgage. You understand? If not, stop the presentation and, and make sure you understand. Because the calculation is very simple, but some people get confused about what goes where. You, the 80% the is on the fair market value of the home. That gives us $160,000 of potential lending. But we already owe one hundred and fifty. They're not going to lend, allow us to, to lend it twice. Some people try to do that, and then they, they borrow everything and then run out of the country. It's called uh, fraud. Um, <laughs> 160 minus the 150 that we already owe is $10,000. And what they will do is they will give you a $10,000 home equity line of credit. So if the furnace blows up or if there's a, the car has a baby or whatever, there's an emergency that is unforeseen, you can tap into your home equity line of credit. All right? Yeah. That's a reputable lender a credit union, a bank of, repu of repute. But some unscrupulous lenders will let you borrow more than the available equity in your home. Have you ever seen or have you ever heard these ads? Get a 125% home equity loan. Consolidate your car loans and credit card bills into one easy monthly payment. Now, when do you see these? Mm, they're starting to come back, but you saw these before the Great Recession everywhere folks because home prices were going up so it was easy for them they could e they could say hey no problem we know the house is going to be worth you know 25 percent more next year no problem we can we can uh get our money back we're talking about the lenders we're not talking about the the uh, the, pre the borrowers <laughs> the borrowers they don't care about because what they don't tell you what's not in the ad is run up your credit card bills all over again that's what they're accounting you to do they're, they're assuming you're going to do that after you zero out all your credit cards Ooh, I'm zero, use me again, and then lose your house when, to us when we foreclose. And that's why the lender in the, the, um, the uh, instruction worksheet is called Foreclose on Us Soon or something like that. So uh, it's, it's not a real company. So, so be careful, be careful, because here's what happens. It's the same calculation, but in, the only thing is different is the 125%. We have the same home with, with $200,000 worth of value, fair market value. That's the asset. We have the same $150,000 mortgage. We have the same home equity, $50,000 net worth. But now we take the 125% times $200,000 and get two fifty. dollars Remember, it was one sixty dollars in the previous. So two fifty dollars minus one fifty. dollars that's $100,000. You now have a home equity line of credit of hundred grand. So what are you going to do? I'm going to go out and buy a click car. I'm going to go out and buy a big money waster. And if you use only 50%, $50,000, only half of your credit line of credit, you now owe more than the house is worth. You are underwater. You have what is called negative equity. If you got into financial trouble, you would be tempted to simply walk away from your home, which is what these lenders wanted to tap it. You know, they were hoping that you would lose the house to them and housing prices were, were going up very quickly so they could turn around and sell it for a profit. Aha, uh -huh, right. <laughs> so, again, here we are. We have that same, you know, debt can be very useful to us and it can be 
disastrous. Slide 26. All right, where do we get a, our credit from? Well, the book uh, outlines inexpensive loans, medium price loans, and expensive loans. And exp inexpensive loans, they recommend parents and family members. And I changed the font for that one, folks. Don't even think about it. Don't do it. Don't lend. Don't borrow. Unless, you know, you just assume that you're not going to get the money back. Because, oh boy, can it destroy friendships. Can it destroy family relationships. It's a mess. Now, there is a, an exception to this. There is a big exception to this that we'll talk about in Chapter 7 called equity in equity uh, share um, a, uh, it's a it was discussed in chapter seven when you buy a home together the family buys a home together it uh, that can be very very cool equity appreciation uh, loans based on assets such as a savings account a secured loan based on your home or car should have a much lower interest rate than an unsecured loan and we'll discuss this in detail because this is a great way to to get started. It's a great way to get started. Now, commercial banks, credit unions are, are very good, folks. Credit unions, are, you know, this is their lifeblood. They, 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 they want you to have a good uh, um, credit score, but yeah, they, 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 they're going to want to take care of you. But car dealerships, appliance dealerships, no, they have very expensive loans. Credit cards, cash advances. Sometimes the car dealership will say, ooh, we'll talk about cars in Chapter 6. Ooh, it's only 1% or 2%, but you're giving up something else in return, so don't think you're getting the best deal. Check out the credit unions and the banks. So slide number 27. Here's where we define secured and unsecured credit, because this is important. Uh, we already said that secured credit is a loan that's based on an asset. It's called collateral. That's the that's the, um, the the term. What's backing up this loan? If it's your automobile, they you know pay. They take the car. If it's your home loan, they take the house. Now they don't want to, folks. The banks. That's not their job. They don't want to take your car. They don't want to take your home, but they can in case you stop paying them. Whereas anything that is unsecured is backed by the full faith and credit of that individual, which means there's nothing you can take. There's no asset that you can take. They have to come after you and garnish your wages or just hound you until you pay them or just basically give up. And this allows us to uh, get started, folks, this idea. Because what we can do, if we have no credit history or maybe a very, very bad history, we can go to a credit union or bank and say, look, I got $500 here. I have $500, and I want to get a secured credit card. And so what you do is you deposit that $500 in a special savings account, which is off limits. It's in the lockbox. You can't touch it. And you receive a credit card with a limit of, surprise, $500, right? <laughs> which means exactly in the agreement that you sign, if you don't make the payments, they'll take them automatically out of the savings account. Now, you don't want this, folks. You want to pay off the balance each month. Set it up so that it's automatically taken out of your checking account. Automatically paid off every month. So you don't have to worry about it. And then use the credit card to buy 800 calories of sugar at Jimba Jamba Jumba Juice. And um, you know, use it for you know, 30, 40 bucks a month. I don't care. Whatever. Just pay it off. And make sure the issuer reports to credit usage, and any reputable bank, any credit union is going to do that. And we'll discuss that in the next presentation, the, the credit super bureaus and how this whole thing works to our, their advantage and your advantage too, the credit score. After a year, maybe even less, they, the benevolent machine will see you as a good credit risk, and your credit score will rise to the point that you're going to start getting these things in the mail. You're going to start getting unsecured credit card applications. I don't, they don't use the word unsecured. They just say, hey, would you like a credit card? And, and now your credit union, your bank, is also going to take notice and say, ooh, um, <laughs> we don't want to lose you as a customer. Here, would you like to uh, uh, reapply for an unsecured credit card? And you say yes, and then you get your $500 back. Does it make sense? 
Does it make sense? If not, you know, contact your bank or credit union or contact me. It's a great way to get started, a great way to rebuild your credit if <coughs> you are naughty, and uh, use it, uh, use it, use it, use it. Slide number 29. How do you measure your credit capacity? Well, ask yourself, can you afford it? What do you plan to give up in order to make the payments, right? Opportunity costs. And look closely at the two ratios, debt payments to income ratio, the more important one, and the debt to equity ratio, because that's what the, their systems do it automatically. You could bring it in and you could show them and they'll be very impressed, but, but their computers do it automatically, so they don't care. Better yet, you know, don't do it. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, if you're going to take out a loan, you're going to make payments, uh, ask yourself. And then here are the calculations. And they're in the book, and they're in the assignments, and the worksheet, and, and uh, well, actually not on the worksheet, but in the assignment. But here they're in this, the presentation, so, so check out the calculations. You take your monthly payments and divide them by your monthly after-tax income. Now we're talking about debt payments. Not all payments, just debt payments. And this does not include housing. And the book says should this, this should be less than 20%. Well, I think it's way too high. And personally, I think it's too high. I think you should keep it down to 5 or 10. But that's in my humble opinion. Uh, so here is an example on page 152. And it's, you know, depending what edition you have, it'll, it'll be close to that. So the monthly gross income of this individual is $1,500. So we take the taxes, the, the Social Security, IRA, and we get the net income. So we, that's the one we're interested in, the net income. And then we add up the debt payments. Don't put in your cell phone payment or the, or the internet access or, or, your, or your gym memberships. These are debt payments. Those are discretionary. You could stop. I know you can't stop making your cell phone payment because you have to have that. But these are debt payments that you are legally required to pay or else you're going to you know, wind up in bankruptcy court. And so here are the monthly debt payments. So divide the monthly debt payments divided by the monthly net income, and this person's at 20%, which means they're pretty darn, they can't take out another loan. They're, yeah, they're, 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 they're bumping up against it, folks. So you're going to do this in your assignment. There's a, a problem that's, that, is, um, that asks you to do this, and just use this as a template, because it's pretty straightforward and in the book. And, and then you're going to do it for yourself. You're going to do it for yourself, and hint, 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 if you have no debt payments, it's zero, right? Because the zero divided by anything is zero percent. So that, that should be easy for some of you. Slide 32. The debt to equity ratio is not as important, but still it's something we, that they will do and you want to do. You take your total liabilities, again, excluding the home loan, the home uh, value, the home mortgage, you take those out, and you divide it by your net worth, and keep that under 100% or 1. Oh, again, this is far too high in my humble opinion, but here's an example that is not atypical for some um, uh, millennials, especially when we didn't even include student loan here. But if you have an automobile, furniture, mi computer, miscellaneous, $12,000 of total assets, right? And then uh, divide that by your total debts, your total liabilities. I'm sorry, the other way around. You take your debts, there's your total debt, 13000 divided by the total assets, uh, they call it equity here, but it's really assets, and you get the debt to equity ratio, and this person is negative, right, one over 100%. They owe more than their, uh, their worth. Yeah, again, we're not including housing, so that's a whole different issue, that's that's chapter 7, because houses are a whole different issue when it comes to that. So there's going to be a problem like this also. So use this slide as your template, as your example. Slide number 34, our last slide before we take a break, and that is co-signing. Somewhere along the line, someone's going to come up to you, family member, friend, the bank won't give me a loan. They said they'd give me a loan if somebody co-signed for me. Would you co-sign for me? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, folks. What does it mean? It means basically the bank, the credit union. They, this is their job. They know that this person's not going to pay, which is why they want somebody to co-sign for them. So that's why they're asking for a co-signer. So guess what? Who's going to wind up paying? You are, right? <laughs> because that's how it works, folks. You signed, meaning they're going to come after you. And surprise, three out of four co-signers end up paying the loan. Because if you don't, it's going to affect your credit report. Right, it's going to hit you. So make sure you understand that you're basically going to be the one who pays this darn thing off. Oof. And um, the answer, by the way, is no. <laughs> so you should practice your no now. You should practice. You should say um, uh, no. Uh, you can do it really fast. No, forget it. Just end of discussion. Or what I like to do is draw it out. I like to say no. <laughs> and in the face-to-face -face class, because I'm a goofball, we practice saying no to somebody who who asks us to co-sign. So practice that in the mirror. No, you know, no way. Or yeah, no, no, not, not going to happen. Okay, all right. So now time for a break, right? And when we come back, we're going to discuss how this whole thing works. The credit ratings, the credit agencies and the, the credit scores and the ratings. And so, uh, and then we'll talk about what happens when things go badly. And so, go back over, make sure you can do the, the calculations, and make sure you understand the different types of loans and the like, and we'll see you in our next presentation on credit. <laughs>